Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible class time. Uh, we'll have just a few introductory remarks while people are logging in. Um, don't want to get into the text itself before people are ready for it. Uh, hopefully you've had a good day here in Mountain Home today. It started off kind of cloudy and a little bit rainy even this morning, but then turned into a beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Uh, looking forward to more of this beautiful May weather. Uh, we've always said and always heard it said that April flowers bring May flowers. And I think we had a lot of flowers already in April, but we're getting even more of them in May, and making for a very beautiful time of year. Uh, hopefully things are going to be loosening up as far as our activities are concerned, and we'll be able to get out and enjoy uh, things a little bit better. Uh, those of you who are members of the Mountain Home Congregation, hopefully you heard the one call today from our brother Dennis Tyndall, one of our elders, and said that uh, though the uh, government regulations for the state of Arkansas, the governor's kind of loosening things up to some extent, and some churches are going to be allowed to meet this coming week, yet our elders have decided to wait. They have a target date of May 17th as our first Sunday back, and there'll be a lot more information about that as the time gets closer. But that's our target date right now, and of course that depends on how things go as more and more people interact and whether the uh, statistics as far as active cases in the county uh, start rising and things such as that. They're keeping a very close eye on the uh, st statistics and on what all is going on. And they want everyone to be safe before we're uh, getting back to normal. But they're looking at a target date for Sunday, May 17th as our first Sunday back to meet for worship. Well, if you have your Bible open and want to turn back again to the gospel according to John, that's where we're studying from on Sundays and Wednesdays, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. And last time, the last two lessons we've studied from the first part of John chapter three, we first looked at the man Nicodemus and learned several interesting points about him. And then we looked at what Jesus told Nicodemus, what he talked about him about the new birth, being born again or as some translations say, born from above. As a matter of fact, it is thought by some that uh, Jesus purposely used a word that could be uh, taken both ways. But Nicodemus misunderstood thinking born again in the sense of entering his mother's womb, where Jesus was really meaning the sense of born from above, that is born of the Holy Spirit and of water. It's a spiritual part of man, his spirit that is reborn. And so Jesus explained that to Nicodemus earlier here in chapter three. Well, today we're gonna to be looking at what I believe is probably one of the most uh, well-known passages in all the Bible, John chapter three and verse 16. I hope that you were able to get on the Facebook page a little bit earlier and have a, uh, the fill in the blank outline in front of you. We're looking tonight at the cost of our salvation. And John chapter three and verse 16, as I said, is a very, a familiar passage. Many people memorized it probably when they were very young. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many people have quoted that verse. They've uh, written it on uh, billboards. They have uh, uh, done just about everything with that verse as far as getting it publicized. I remember many years ago, back in the 60s and 70s, there used to be a man with uh, rainbow colored hair and he would show up at all different kinds of sporting events and he'd always manage to get on camera and he would have a sign and all it said on the sign was John 316. And of course, a lot of people didn't have to have it written out for them, they knew exactly what it meant. But uh, we're gonna be looking tonight at something about this verse. You know, someone has said that it is the most superlative verse in the Bible because it has the greatest subject, God. It has the greatest object, the world. It has the greatest uh, activity or verb, so loved. It has the greatest action, he gave. And then it has the greatest gift, his son. And then it has the greatest object or purpose in view, which is to keep people from perishing eternally and instead that they could have eternal life. So it's truly, it is a superlative verse. It's filled with the greatest things and the most 
uh, comprehensive things that can fill our minds. But tonight we're going to be looking at this verse or using it as a starting point for uh, looking at things a little bit differently. You know, so often, many times we hear, and even the Bible teaches, that in some sense salvation is free. Now, back in Isaiah chapter 55, if you want to turn there to Isaiah 55 and verse 1, you'll find there that Isaiah says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And of course, as you continue reading in that chapter, you'll find that what Isaiah is doing is using these words in a, a spiritual fashion, that is, in a figurative sense. It's not literal wine and milk that he's talking about. It's not literal physical food for the body, but it's for the soul. You look on down just a couple of verses. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David, etc. Well, then also in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 22, and if you look at verses uh, 16 and 17, uh, here we find where it says that I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And then verse 17 says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And these words pretty well echo what Isaiah 55 and verse 1 had said. Great invitations, precious invitations that the Lord offers us. The Lord God in Isaiah 55, the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17 the invitation to come. And the implication here is that in a sense, our salvation is indeed free in the sense that we can't buy it. We can't earn it. We can't do anything to merit it. It has been provided for us as the uh, parable that Jesus tells over in the gospel of Matthew, all things are ready. Come to the feast. That was the king's invitation to the wedding feast for his son. Of course, again, a parable there that has a great, great uh, deal of richer meaning behind it. But as we uh, look here at John chapter 3 and verse 16 as our starting point, what is there about salvation that is costly? And we're going to look at it from three different perspectives. And we'll begin by looking at it from God's perspective. Look at it from God's perspective, if you will. How costly is our salvation? How precious is our salvation to God? Well, the Bible says that it cost him his only son. It cost him his only son. The very verse that we just looked at, John 3 and verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's what it cost God. Again, if you look over to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, there we find that uh, it wasn't because we had pleaded with God to save us. It was not that we had uh, repented and threw ourselves on God's mercy. Paul says instead that God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, that's how great God's love is. And that is how great his act of giving his son for us, even while we were still sinners. And then in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, John shows us, here's the greatest definition of love. He says, in this is love, not that we love God. That's not the standard that we use to measure the greatness of love. Not that we loved God, but here, that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Sent his son to deal with the problem of sin sent his son to be the, the means of covering over and taking away our sins. As Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 says, sin places us under the wrath of God. Romans 3, 21 to 26 shows us how we get out from under that wrath. It is through the propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So from God's perspective, our salvation is truly costly. It cost him his son. 
Then secondly, we need to look at Jesus' perspective of our salvation. What about his perspective? Well, the Bible tells us there that it cost Jesus his life. Salvation cost him his life. And we see this in many places. Uh, we find, for example, over in uh, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, where in the context, the sons of Zebedee had asked Jesus for a favor. And before he would tell them that he would grant the favor, he asks what it is that they want him to do. And they said, grant that one of us might sit on your right hand and one on your left hand when you come into the kingdom. And Jesus said, I cannot promise that. It's not mine to give. And of course, the other disciples were indignant or angry toward James and John. And Jesus called all of his disciples together and taught them about true leadership. True leadership. The one who is going to be greatest among you is going to be your servant. And then he says, just as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, before this, beginning in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus had told the disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He would be taken into custody by the chief priests and he would be beaten and ultimately he would be crucified, but that he would be raised from the dead on the third day. But they didn't understand that. And he repeated it several more times. And here again, very clearly, by using the word ransom, he is showing that his death is not just a giant accident. It's not just a man dying for a good cause, but it is the son of God dying for the release, the ransom, the redemption, the purchase of men from the bondage of sin. And then also we see in John chapter 15, if you look there in verses 13 through 15, Jesus there tells his disciples, great love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Now you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. And notice that Jesus says that this is great love. This is the demonstration of the greatest love that we have within our power to demonstrate to anyone. And that is to give our lives, to lay down our lives for the sake of someone else. And that, of course, is exactly what Jesus did for us. Our salvation then from God's part, it cost, the, it cost him his only son. From Jesus' perspective, it cost his life. But now let us notice from our perspective, our perspective on salvation. Now, we've said that the Bible shows us that in one sense, our salvation is free. We can't merit it. We can't earn it. We can't put God in our debt. But on the other hand, there is a sense in which it is very costly. And we're going to be noticing some of those passages that show us that. For example, we find that Jesus tells people that they need to forsake all, to forsake all in order to be his disciple. If you look over, for example, in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 30, to the multitude, to the multitude who was following him. The Bible says there the great crowds were following him. Now, in our day and time, we, we would, would be thrilled with that. The more people, the better. But Jesus turned around, and it's almost as if he is purposely wanting to thin out the crowd. He's wanting to see how serious these people are. By extension, he needs, he's wanting to see how serious we are about following him. Listen to the words that he says. Great crowds accompanied him. They turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Who does, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Those are harsh words. Those are strong words. They're powerful words. They're challenging words that Jesus is uttering. The word hate, as he uses it here, it doesn't mean to despise. It doesn't mean that we can't stand the sight of them any longer. What he means is that they are the ones that take second place. 
uh, in the Old Testament book of Genesis, if you remember when Jacob had served his uh, soon-to-be father-in-law Laban for seven years, he expected to marry Rachel because he was the one that she that he loved, and her sister Leah was hated. Well, that word doesn't mean mean that he couldn't stand the sight of her. He didn't want anywhere around. He ended up marrying her, and she bore him uh, many children. But what it means is that he was she wasn't the one that Jacob chose. He chose Rachel. She was the one he loved. Leah was the one who was left, the one not chosen. Jesus says here in Luke chapter 14, that when it comes to a choice between him and even our closest family members, the closest relationships we know on this earth, Jesus says they have to take a back seat. You have to choose me even above them. And then, of course, we also see in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 29, Jesus was approached by a young man who was very rich and was also a ruler. For that reason, we call him the rich young ruler. But he approached Jesus and he came running up to him and he got down on his knees in front of Jesus. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus, first of all, asked, well, why are you calling me good? Do you really understand? And what you're saying when you're approaching me this way and uh, calling me good, but then he says, "We'll keep the commandments. Which ones? Well, you shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not uh, bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Things like that." Quoting basically from many of the Ten Commandments. And then he says, "Well, all of these I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack?" Jesus says, "This is what you lack. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor." And you can come back and follow me. The Bible says the man went away very sorrowful because he had great possessions. He wasn't willing to do that. He wasn't willing to, to let go. He wasn't willing to choose Jesus over his material wealth. And that same challenge comes to us. Not that we have to forsake everything. It's interesting that this uh, occasion of the rich young ruler occurs in Luke chapter 18 in Luke's account. And then in chapter 19, when Jesus went to uh, Zacchaeus's house, Zacchaeus said, look, Lord, from this point on, I'm giving half of my goods to the poor. And then if I have needed anyone in the tax collecting business, I'm going to give back fourfold. Well, Jesus didn't say that. that's not good enough, Zacchaeus. You can't just give away half, but you have to give it all. He didn't tell that to Zacchaeus. Difference in attitude. He could already tell the repentance. As a matter of fact, he said, repentance has come to this house today. But what he does challenge us to do is to choose him above any of our riches, whatever percentage it might be that would stand in the way between him and, and us, between our relationship with us and him. So it means forsaking all. Now, over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, we find an illustration there of a man who didn't choose to do that, a man by the name of Demas. And Paul says that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He chose the world over Paul. And of course, by, by that, we mean not only Paul, but the gospel that Paul was preaching and the salvation that Paul was taking to uh, that part of the world at that time. Uh, Demas loved this present world, and that was the choice that he made. We need to be careful in those choices. So we need to forsake all. We need to be taking part in what's called self-denial, denying oneself. In Matthew 16 and verse 24, a passage very similar to what we read in Luke chapter 14, there we find that Jesus says that whoever would come after me, let him deny himself and let him take up his cross and then let him follow me. Those are the stages, you might say, or those are the steps in following after Jesus, but denying self comes first. Self-denial is the opposite of self-indulgence. We live in an indulgent society. We live in a culture that, that promotes us to indulge ourselves in whatever food that we want or whatever entertainment that we want or whatever uh, trinkets we want or whatever house we want to buy or car we want to buy, just indulge yourself. You deserve it. Jesus says the opposite. 
He says, rather than indulging ourselves, we need to deny ourselves. Self-denial recognizes the truth of a statement we read several times in the Bible and in, in the gospel accounts, that he who saves his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake, Jesus says, he is the one who will find it. That's self-denial. Self-indulgence and self-promotion and things such as that will lead us nowhere. It will get us to an end of a very terrible road with a terrible destination. And then next, we find that it will lead us to a life of suffering, a life of suffering. Now, suffering takes different forms. It doesn't always mean physical pain. It doesn't always mean either uh, being uh, in, a, in an accident where we are crippled or where we have a, a terrible disease. There are all different kinds of suffering. The Bible has a lot to say about suffering. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, if you remember there, Paul says that all who will live godly will suffer persecution. Those who will live godly in Christ Jesus in this life will suffer persecution. You ever stop to think that if you're not being persecuted, we need to maybe examine ourselves and see whether there's enough difference between the way that we're living, what we're doing, the way that we act, how we talk and how we dress and where we go and what we're doing. Is there enough difference between us and the world that we're worth persecuting? And see, if we're not being persecuted, it may not be that the world is taking such an indifferent attitude toward us. It may be that we have taken an indifferent attitude toward the gospel and toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward our salvation. Paul says all who would live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you want to read about suffering, I, I would encourage you to read First Peter. Every chapter of First Peter has a reference to suffering. In chapter 1, you'll see in verses 6 through 9, where there Peter says, that in this you rejoice, and that is the salvation that he is referred to in verse 5. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 2, we have two different passages, but I'd like for you to read read with me verses 20 to 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning verse 20. What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. By putting together our suffering next to Jesus' suffering. I think what Peter is doing is twofold. One thing, he's showing us that we're following in the steps of Jesus in our suffering. And then again, whatever suffering we endure is nothing in comparison with what he endured for us. And so he's encouraging us and challenging us to endure that. Chapter 4, Look at verses 12 through 16. There are several passages in chapter 3 as well, but in chapter 4, look at verses 12 through 16. Here Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. A long time ago, I heard the statement made that if you're ever brought up on charges for being a Christian, Make sure there's enough evidence for a conviction. 
That's what Peter is saying here in first Peter chapter four. And then look over in chapter five and verse 10, he says very succinctly that after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace, God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Notice the promise there. After we've suffered for a little while, then we have to look forward to the restoration, confirmation, strengthening, and establishment that only God can give to us. So we need to live a life of, of uh, suffering. Does the world see so little difference in us that we are not worth persecuting? Then we need to live a life of doing good. It's going to cost us our energy and our time and our, our talents to serve the Lord. It's going to cost us a life of doing good or good works. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, Paul there tells the Ephesians that we are his workmanship or his craftsmanship or some people like the translation, his masterpiece. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then in Philippians chapter 2, in verses 12 and 13, there Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Then in Titus chapter 2, and in the book of Titus, chapters 2 and 3, you'll find several different occasions where Paul there is encouraging good works. If, if he, uh, Titus 2 and verse 7, uh, there Paul says that, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity and dignity, etc. And then down in verse 14, and actually we need to uh, turn uh, a little bit uh, before that, look at verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own possession. And notice how they're going to be characterized as zealous for good works. The people whom Jesus possesses are those who are zealous for good works. And then in chapter three and verse one, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Chapter three and verse eight, the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And then down in verse 14, he says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. When we become a Christian, we decide to make the choice to love Jesus and we decide to follow him. It's going to cost us a life demonstrating good works. And then we find that it's going to be a life of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Of course, we're all very familiar with Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. That's one of those verses it's almost hard to quote anymore without almost singing it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And that these things that Jesus is talking about is what he's just referred to earlier in that context of what are we going to eat and what are we going to drink and wherewith shall we be clothed and how are we going to have shelter over our heads? All the mundane things that we are concerned about that oftentimes consume us. Jesus says, if you get your priorities in order, if you put first things first and you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then these other things will be taken care of. Your heavenly father takes care of the lilies of the field. Your heavenly father takes care of the birds of the air. Won't he take care of you? Oh, you of little faith. We need to have the confidence, the faith, the trust in God that he will indeed take care of us. There are a lot of good things out in the world that can take us and distract us away from our priority of the kingdom of God. 
social clubs, civic groups, athletic contests, recreational activities, making a living, keeping up the house, all of those things can become a stumbling block. Nothing wrong in and of themselves, but every one of them can stand in our way if we give them a priority they don't deserve. If we put them above and put a greater emphasis and give more time and devotion to those things than we do to Jesus Christ and his kingdom, any one of those or all of them together can keep us away from our costly salvation. So as we see our salvation free in one sense, but not so free in another sense, We'll close tonight by looking at Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, where Paul there says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. The picture that Paul is presenting there, the, the word present, he's used that word over in Romans chapter 6 when we became a Christian. That is through our obedience to the gospel and being baptized into Christ and raised with him to walk in newness of life and obeying the form of doctrine that was delivered us. All those things in, in Romans chapter six, he talks about presenting. That's when we present ourselves to the Lord. And in the Old Testament, that word had reference to one who was bringing his sacrifice. And he would present that sacrifice to the priest. Well, we present not a dead, an animal that's going to be put to death, we present our bodies, we present ourselves, and we're offering them not to be put to death physically, but as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. A living sacrifice is not just an activity, it's a lifestyle. When you count the cost, we need to realize that salvation is still the greatest bargain ever. Well, we thank you for joining with us in our Bible class tonight. Uh, Lord willing, Friday morning, we'll be back with our next lesson in the How to Study the Bible series, Friday morning at 1030. And then Sunday morning, we'll be back here on Facebook Live at 1030. Uh, the men will have the singing and the devotional for the Lord's Supper available at eight o'clock in the morning. And then at five o'clock Sunday evening, we'll be back for an evening uh, lesson for our evening time then. Uh, before we dismiss tonight, let's bow for a word, word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pause to give you thanks for the opportunity that we have, that even though we can't assemble together physically, we can still join our hearts and minds together in these Bible studies. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for those who have joined with us in our live broadcast, and we thank you for others who may be watching a recorded version of it. Father, we just pray that our study together has been beneficial to each one of us. We thank you for the great love that you have, and thank you for the love that Jesus had in sacrificing himself, shedding his blood so that we can have this salvation. Father, let us not think of it as too cheap. Let us realize that it's going to cost us these things that we've talked about this evening. Father, we have several that we're going to be mentioning tonight in our prayers. We don't know everybody, but we want to mention especially Pam Lewis and the loss of her father, Gerald Cotter, Pray for that family as they're going to be going through the funeral Friday afternoon. We pray for Theo Rowe and his continued uh, recovery from his heart valve repair down in Little Rock and pray that as he continues to gain his strength, he'll be able to return to Mountain Home just as soon as possible. Pray for Betty White, who is the sister of Ellis Jones and Wanda Fisher and her continued recovery in Birmingham, Alabama for her brain tumor surgery. Father, there are many others. We just pray that you'll be with each one of them and be with all of our families who are uh, struggling, be with those who are struggling because of the financial crisis that this uh, quarantine has brought on so many. We pray for those who are working in health care facilities where they're treating those with the virus. We pray also for uh, those of our community to keep us safe. And especially, Father, though, we thank you for Jesus because whether we're safe here or not, we want to be safe in his arms. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Again, we thank you for listening. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you.